Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Fear and Addiction. And it is part of the Human Soul series. It was presented in Philadelphia, USA on the 21st of July, 2012. So today we were wondering what you would like to do. If you had a choice, what would you like to do? What would you like to hear about or... Yep. Um, if we can use the mic so, so for this part, so if we... Um, so Dana, you want to mention? It would be lovely to hear about some more celestial spirits or spirits who are trying to grow. So, okay. in a sense, you'd like to hear some more channeling, is that That's what it. you're saying? Yep, okay. Well, last night, for those of you who weren't here last night, we did some channeling last night, but it was of some spirits who were in, who were in a place of what we would probably call denied emotion, let's call it, mm. in the first sphere, and, and it was quite an interesting channeling, yeah. I'd like to hear a little more about, um, even though I've watched a lot of YouTubes, the actual processing of the emotions and... and being able to get to the core, you know, whatever you, emotion or the yeah. causal mm -hmm. emotion and what you do, you know, when you get there. I mean, I, I have an understanding of the concept, but, you know, just, you know. Yep, okay. okay. Um, can I be blunt We're about that subject? I've covered it so many times before um, and there is so much information on YouTube about it. The reality is that most of us still do not want to actually be like a child when we experience our emotion. And so we, we, we still ask the same question over and over again because we don't like the answer we've already got. <laughs> Does that make sense? And, and yeah. I feel that is an issue that we need to address. The fact that, that we are very resistive to actually being like a child once we get to an emotion. And, and we need to look at our reasons why we're resistive to that. And a lot of that is about what other people think of us, what it's going to look like, how we're going to feel about it ourselves, that we might feel a bit crazy or, or, or so forth. And these are just emotions too that we need to let ourselves feel. So uh, I'm not that inclined to probably address that subject today, mm -hmm. if that's all right. No, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. And I've done it and I've been doing it yeah. and I feel it. And I, I guess it's where I get stuck with the anger. Like, oh, I, like agree. I can do the grief, I can do the sobbing, I can do the... Can, and can I can suggest, if you get stuck with the anger, yeah. then your fear and your grief isn't actually okay, being felt. Okay, down the bottom. Because the reality okay, yeah. is that emotions are underneath emotions. Okay, so, so, so the right. anger emotion, if you're unwilling to feel it, you, okay. will eventually, you will not be able to get to your fear. So I really had to work on feeling my anger. Yes. Okay. Well, and but, uh, not, uh, but not uh, expressing it or dumping it on anybody. others. I, yeah. I get that. I get <laughs> that. Okay. Does that make sense? And yeah. really what I feel it's good for everyone to look at I, and I was mentioning this to someone before we started last night, is to look at the area of addiction and fear that we have around emotion. So we often really get focused on, I've got to cry causally, I've got to get to the cause, I've got to, I know that's the thing that changes my soul. When in reality, if we just deal with addiction in our life, which is the thing that causes anger, then the process begins to unfold naturally anyway. That's been my experience. So not getting what you want, so you're angry. So the addiction exactly. is not yes. getting what I want. Exactly. And feeling the pain of right. the fact that, oh, I'm going to have I to release this belief that I can get what I want. Okay. That's going to hurt, okay. you know. That kind of pain is the stuff that really frees us up to get to the, to the real processing. Right. But most people, um, I observe, get caught up on, I've got to have a big cry. And often they kid themselves that, oh, I'm crying causally, when actually I'm having a kind of a tantrum that I can't get what I want. And I'm, I, and I, I'm I like tell a myself child on the ground going like this, like <laughs> yeah, this, like yeah. this, you know, and screaming their head off, really. That's what we're doing a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that really answered a lot for me, just saying to, just tie, hold the to tie it to the addiction, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. I feel if everyone just focused on addiction, the whole thing would get more challenging really quickly, <laughs> but more rewarding also. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. so a discussion about addiction would be very interesting. Okay, how about a discussion? Yeah. So I'd yeah. be perfectly happy to engage that discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, AJ. G'day. Mary. Hi. Um, I have an eight-year-old daughter, mm -hmm. and one of the challenges that I have is trying to teach her about God, mm -hmm. 
but not through the channels of organized religion. Yes. And so this is my church, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I'd like to know how you would advise parents to teach our children about how to get in touch with their emotions in the moment so that they can continue to be aware of their soul condition. Mm. Yeah, um, I can briefly answer that question for you right now, if you wish. Um, the the th feeling I have is that most parents are not aware that God's created this beautiful universe where we can teach our children about God every single moment of the day. That everything in the universe is geared to teach us about God. The complexity of life that's around us, the creation and, 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 and its integral power and also complexity um, is such a, a great way to just engage your children with constantly and ask them questions about how do you think that got here? Who do you think put it here? Where did this intelligence come from? And, and actually engaging them in this process of teaching them about life. You see, when you do that, the emotions become a secondary issue to their progress. And the reality is our emotions are, in reality, a secondary issue to our progress. I feel for a lot of people, when I talk about emotions, they then, most people then go, oh, well, I've got to do the emotional work, I've got to do the emotional work. But actually, the emotional work is a secondary issue. It's more about desire for God and desire for truth and having humility. And emotions are a part of humility. So, so uh, while em dealing with your emotions are an important part of your progression towards God, if your focus is just to teach the child emotions then, or about emotions, then firstly you're going to um, miss some very basic truths. One is your child knows how to express its emotions better than you do. <laughs> so it's going to be quite impossible for you to teach your child about emotions and emotional work it's probably better to watch what your child does and learn from them. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So it's impossible to really teach your child about the proper expression of emotions when you yourself are quite shut down emotionally. The reality is what you need to teach them are the things that you can teach them. <laughs> One of the things you can teach them is this connection with the universe around them. Now, I, I don't know what it's like for most of you here in the USA, but every s person we've met in the USA generally is quite disconnected from nature, quite disconnected from, you know, the outside world, you know. You, and, and we see that quite a lot uh, in most Western civilizations. You see this very strong disconnection from nature. But nature tells us so much about God. The more we find out about nature, the more we find out how amazingly complex and beautiful everything is that God's created. Now, if you engage your child in that process of questioning them and getting them to question their environment in the same way, look at their environment, ask themselves some basic questions about intelligence and so forth, what's there, where did it come from, and, all, and, and get them feeling about those things, and then take the opportunities when, they, when they're available when they ask questions, so, Mummy, do you think God exists? Then you say, I, you can say, well, I don't really know, actually. I, I think I look at the creation around me, if this is your opinion. You can say, I, I look at the creation around me, I think, yes, God definitely exists, but I, I don't always feel a personal connection with God, so that, you know, that makes it then difficult. So you can then have these really honest and truthful conversations with your child about that. The second area that's really good to work on with your child is teaching them how to use their free will in a loving manner. In other words, always engaging, teaching them how they can do their life with every choice that they've made and make sure that every choice that they made has love as its basis. If you do those two particular things, your children will end up with a very strong relationship with God. Just those two things. Mm. Yeah. Thank I you. I kind of see it that God has created everything in our existence, like everything that God has created is designed to, to teach us about him and about us. So all of his laws are also in operation on us all of the time, as well as looking at nature. There's all of these things that are happening as we engage our will to give us feedback. So I feel like the best thing a parent can do to teach them about God is to teach them how to learn, basically, from God which is to observe, 
in now you have some knowledge of the laws, to, is to help them understand the laws and help them recognize the laws in action in their life because those are the things that are going to help them eternally grow and eternally have their relationship with God. And they, then, they won't, then they're going to know God on their own. So you don't actually have to teach them about God. You can teach them about the way God's designed for them to connect to God and then... Yes, that's really what I wanted. I just want to point her in the right direction, yeah. you know, yeah. so that yeah. she's not confused because I was confused growing yeah. up. So yeah. Yeah. it's really just important to, you know, I, I guess maybe look for something tangible, which is right outside your back door. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there's your no book yard, that yeah. I need to find or there's no, you know, no. whatever. Can I, can I give you an illustration of it? Would somebody like to be my guinea pig? Anybody like to come down here and be my guinea pig? Marina, you're going to have to come down here. <laughs> <laughs> if we Bit of control up, on the guinea pig. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're allowed to <laughs> renege from the agreement. You're allowed to say... I want to go to Spanish Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. And you can smile and breathe because nothing's going to happen to you. <laughs> How tall are you? I'm, on, I'm five eight. I'm six. So five foot, five foot, eight. Inches, is that how you write it? Yeah. Here? Um, what's that in centimetres, do you know? Uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, we might grab a mic, actually, if one of the mics can come down here. And so that... 174, you think it is? I'm not sure. 173, 172. 173, 174, something like that. Centimetres, yeah. Okay. Right. So if that's her height, so... You don't have to do anything here. Oh. It's not, it's not major. That's her height <laughs> to the ground, right? Did you know that there is a mathematical equation that, 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 that actually will tell me where her belly button is? Yeah. And there is a mathematical equation, if you hold out your arm, that will tell me where, how, how long her shoulder, uh, from her shoulder point to the tip of her fingers will be and where her elbow will be and where her wrist will be, and where her fingers will be, right? And it's all the same mathematical equation. Right? Did you know that? Now, isn't that amazing? Right? And, uh, and we'll, we'll write the mathematical equation in a minute. And you can do an experiment on yourself when you, when you go home. And if there is any disproportion in this equation, it's because of an emotional injury you have, actually, which is very interesting. Because the average person will have the perfect equation, the perfect... And if there's any disproportion in any of these things, then it will be based on some kind of emotional injury that's present. So if you also go from the hip down to the foot, there will be a same equation, points at the knee... And also at the ankle point, where, where the ankle joint is, and the length of the foot, and everything is all determined by these equations. Did you know that? No. And did you know that the same equation exists in a pine cone and a pineapple and quite a number of other things? Now, if we think back to we're teaching our child, see, these are things that we can easily teach our child and then get them to question. Why is this proportion... This perfectly proportioned person <laughs> here. <laughs> why is it? <laughs> why, why are you crying about that? <laughs> this, so this perfectly proportional person, why, why do they have these proportions and why do we all think this particular proportion looks good? And when somebody's out of proportion, it doesn't look good to us. Why is that? And you could ask your child, well, why do you think that is? Why, why, where did all this mathematics come from if, if we just evolved like a lot of people say, then where did all this mathematics come from? Like, it, it's a bit like saying, uh, this house, which had to be designed by somebody, didn't have a designer at all, uh, and this room didn't have a designer, but it, but it all come just from, just from an explosion. Have, have, you, <laughs> have you noticed any explosion ever do that for you? <laughs> oh, I haven't noticed one do that for me. Usually when you drop something, it goes everywhere, doesn't it? Doesn't, does it go, oh, oh, I'm being dropped now. I think I'll have some intelligence and put myself back together again. And away I go. And, and this is a beautiful thing that we can teach our children. And this is a, an example of what, what I'm trying to say, is that when we, we often don't do this with our child, right? And we're so worried about teaching about emotions and teaching. But firstly, I feel one of the 
greatest things we can teach our child is that God exists and you have a potential to be able to connect to God through a process. But, but if they have no conf- confidence that God exists, how can you ever teach them to connect to God through a process? We've got to first have some kind of confidence that God exists. And these kind of things, the mathematics in the proportion of a body... Thanks, Marina. Okay. It wasn't, that was easy, wasn't it? Nothing to cry about. I wanted to say something, oh, I wanted to say something as an artist because I like to draw and paint. Yes, yes. And um, when it comes to children, because I, I do a lot with children, it's interesting even mathematically we like measure like a head yes. from here and you can like approximate where the heart or the chest would be. You yeah. take another head and you put it down and yes. a couple of heads reaches your belly button. Where the nose appears, right. where the bridge appears. Exactly. The distance of the mouth between the mouth and the chin right. and the nose. Right. Everything is mathematically yeah. proportional. And it's and and the great thing about children is they never question it. Yeah. They just are like, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Thanks. Uh, where did this come from? Over here somewhere. So, so what I'm illustrating by that is that, is that you see, uh, oftentimes as parents we sort of lack some imagination in a way because we have a world at our fingertips of things that we can teach our children that, that are very f- powerful things that we can teach our children. And yet what do we do with that world? Instead of teaching our children, look, these are all you know, proof that there is some order and cre- creative order in our entire universe, Instead of teaching our child that, we we ignore a lot of the creative order ourselves on our day-to-day life and we go through the mundane process of just having our life. You know, getting up in the morning, taking them to school, picking them up at night, taking them to music practice, bringing them home from that, taking them to soccer or or, or football or whatever and bringing them home from that, then we're all exhausted and we never get to talk about the real things that matter. We have, you know, busy internet lives, busy, you know, machine lives... (laughs) Um, all of which don't teach anything, most of them. Very, t- very, very little of it teaches anything that benefits the soul. And, and if we embraced a teaching process that actually benefited the soul, benefited and satisfied the emotional desire to know truth, um, then we have great ability to have that child within a very few years already experimenting with their own relationship with God. And after the time they're five or six years of age, they, don't, they won't even need you. Isn't that great? <laughs> Many of you want them to need you for the rest of their existence, yes? But they, they, they potentially, if, if we educate our child with all of these skills, potentially by the time they're six years of age, they'll be able to cook for themselves, clean for themselves, tidy up their roof for themselves, live in their own house, because their, their law of attraction would be pretty good, wouldn't it? Being close to God and money-wise, everything would just flow. So, you know, unlike it does for us, they could even live in their own house. And, and what I've recommended to some parents is that if you've got a bigger yard, you just build a house for them at the back. <laughs> and they potentially could have their own food, their own, you know, everything looked after by the time they're, you know, five, six, seven years of age, where they don't need you anymore. And most of us would be quite resistive to that because we like people needing us. Why do we do that? Because we have an addiction, yeah, of it causes us to feel like we have value, right? And if we actually brought up our children so they didn't need us, we we would wonder what our value was. For many of us, we'd wonder what our value was. So um, I'd recommend that any person with a child, uh, we need to teach them these life skills during that process. We'll teach them mathematics, we'll teach them science, we'll teach them all sorts of principles. Yeah, and it'd be so wonderful. By the way, the proportion is uh, for this. If you get a number system and you add the two previous numbers together, you'll get a system that goes like this. (coughs) Oops, sorry, Sorry. can't add up. (laughs) And so forth. That, by the way, has been given a s- series called the Fibonacci series of numbers. Um, very simple series of numbers. But interestingly enough, if you get the uh, larger number and divide it by the smaller number, you will get a number that approximates this. And the further you go on in the series, the closer it gets to that particular number. 
And interestingly, if you get the height of the person, 174 centimetres for Marina, times it by 0.618, you'll get the height of her belly button. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. And if you get the length of the person's arm and times it by 0.618, you'll get the distance from the tip of their finger to their elbow. Same applies from the hip to the foot. And the same applies with the length of your head to where your nose appears at the top and the bottom. And every other relationship that's actually in your body, believe it or not. And interestingly enough, if the pine cone, if you get a pine cone and you count the rotations that it has in one direction and the rotations it has in another direction, you'll find there is eight rotations in one direction and 13 rotations in the other direction. And if you get a pineapple, you'll find that the rotations are 13 and 21. You'll also find that if you have calculate the rotational angle between these two particular numbers, you'll find that wherever most plants grow they, and where they place a leaf is actually at that point of the rotational angle. And the reason why that is, is because that's the point where if there is an infinite or a large number of of branches, each one will re receive the most light that it possibly can at that angle. If you look at a sun sunflower said seed head, you'll find that it's got a rotational angle, the same, but the rotational angles are right up in the hundreds with each seed, but it still meets the count of the Fibonacci series of numbers. And then the question is, well, where did all that come from? All that design. Where did it all come from? So, um, you know, that, and you could just leave the question with the child, couldn't you? Because uh, I think you don't really need to say anything more than that. And they can then wonder and feel about that themselves. Interestingly enough, have any of you ever learnt that at school? No. Isn't that One person. Interesting? One yep. person? <laughs> you, do, you teach it at school? Okay, yeah. okay. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. In the arts, of course. It, it is taught in the arts. But most people, when they've been to school, have never um, been taught that particular, those particular things. In engineering. Engineering, it's occasionally taught, yes. And it, particularly because of densities. Like uh, um, in terms of the density of packing, these are the numbers that are all the ideal densities with regard to packing. And so sometimes in engineering it's taught. But it's pretty rare to have it taught at school, isn't it? Uh, well you think most of us, there's probably 60 or 70 of us here now, and one of us... Um, teachers at school, but we have most of us have never heard it at school. We've heard it through our own reading or something else. And the reason why? why? Why do you think that is? Isn't that weird? Don't you find that weird? Something that could actually give us confidence in the existence of a designer in the universe, and yet, it, and it appears to be a pretty fundamental thing to understand, and yet. Well, our own bodies are <laughs> built by the proportion of it, so <laughs> fairly fundamental thing to understand about ourselves, and yet it's not taught. You've got to start questioning, then, well, why is it not taught? Interesting. Yeah. Maybe there is an investment in everyone not believing in God, after all. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's just an arrogance that we know how to do things better than God does. <laughs> yeah. AJ gave a really awesome, it's a, I think it's on the net now, isn't it, babe? The discussion you had with Justin? Uh, yeah, 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 it is actually. I um, had a, had a, quite often when Mary does her book group, um, obviously, you know, I know the material fairly well, so <laughs> I don't go along <laughs> generally. And instead, um, what has often happened is that we have team leader meetings in Australia with the team leaders, and sometimes the only time I've got available is while Mary's doing her book group. <laughs> I'll sit down in the car <laughs> and have a, a chin wag with one of the team leaders in terms of helping them with their God's Way of Love teams. And Justin, a fellow in Australia, is a leader of... Um, I just need to have a cough. Of the engineering, <coughs> of the development team. Mm. He's an engineer. He's the leader of the development team for the God's Way of Love uh, organisation in our area. And AJ had a great discussion with him about... Um, well, development and designing new things and looking at things from a perspective, not from the way man generally approaches it, but from how God might approach it. And mm. Yeah. 
And it was an inter interesting discussion because it sort of begun in this very... Um, when you're listening to it, you, it, it's, it starts out very slowly. <laughs> and then as the discussion progresses over a period of about an hour, an hour and a half, eventually it gets to the point where Justin doesn't know what to think anymore. <laughs> and it's a very interesting discussion to listen to if you're interested in designing things um, from, from a creative perspective. Um, because it, we talk about how God creates and what God does in comparison to what man does. And just engaging some of those underlying principles, um, you can learn a lot of things but also teach your children a lot of things. Imagine if your children knew things that it's taken you 20, 30, 40, 50 years to get to know yourself and they knew it when they were five or six or seven. You know, imagine what a head start that gives them to the rest of their life. It's like a powerful, powerful place. The, uh, by the way, the audio Mary's referring to is on the uh, website under Events 2012 page of Downloads. And it's called, um, and it's also on the Downloads for the Audios page as well. And it's called God's Way of Love Team Discussions or something like that uh, with, with Justin Crick. Um, and I think we've, I've called it... Um, something about development. Something Creations. Mm. I can't remember exactly. It's worth having a listening, listen to. Um, okay, so that's my suggestion. Yeah, it's fun when you do that with your kids. Yeah, um, I've done that with both of my boys most of my life, and and both of them have a fairly strong viewpoint about the existence of God as a result. So even though they engage in a lot of different things in their life, they both have a fairly strong feeling about God's existence and the and there being proof of God's existence. It's very hard to have faith in something that hasn't been proven to you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Marina, if we have the microphone over that. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Yes, go there first. Okay. Yep. Good morning. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> hi. Um, <coughs> this is also about God, and you might have already talked about <coughs> this, but I'm interested in how God is involved in my life directly, daily, um, even though I don't know it. And I think I'm asking this because I don't feel very connected yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, in another lecture, you mentioned how um, God's energy, I guess, supports our physical existence. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by that. And anything like that that shows me that, you know, I'm, I'm connected even though I don't know it. Yep. Let's uh, have a brief discussion about God's different energies, shall we? Or God's different, uh, the, the different energy systems that come out from God. Because there's quite a number of them and... And a lot of them get misinterpreted as well, I feel. And then perhaps uh, after that, we might have a discussion about addictions, um, yeah. if we can as well. Because that, our addictions are something that God um, can't respond to. And oftentimes we want God to respond to them, but, but, but we can't. So let's uh, discuss the, the energies that are coming from God. Now, all of you have heard about the Holy Spirit. And all of you are aware that we're not talking about a person there. <laughs> Do you understand? So not talking about a person. Um, in fact, whenever in the first century, I used to use the word spirit to discuss God's energies quite frequently because it had the same word as wind. And, and so therefore, it, it was something that you could describe as you know, something that somebody couldn't see but that had an effect on something. And uh, for that reason, uh, um, I use that word to describe the holy wind, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, which is uh, one of the energy systems, if you like. It's an energy system that comes from God. Uh -huh. There's also a creative spirit. That comes from God. There's also a maintaining spirit that comes from God. There's also a life spirit coming from God. or Remember, each of these is energy or forces. They're all forces. You need an R in energy, baby. So I do. So they're all, ener they're all energy or forces. Um, 
Now, some of you have heard of the uh, maintaining spirit. Um, you would have heard it called prana. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a spirit that God, that God distributes to all living things in the, in the universe um, and can deliver and does deliver to us in help, to help us maintain our bodies and so forth as well. Um, and we can actually live on it without eating anything and, uh, and you can also live on it without drinking anything. Um, now, I wouldn't recommend that right at this point in time for most of you because you'll die doing that in your attempt. Right? But it is a force that it does exist. The life spirit or force is a, is, a, is a force that God uses that is inherent and pregnant in all areas of life. And then when, it, when something dies or becomes inanimate, this force returns back to God. In other words, God feels when something dies. So anything that dies in the universe, from any little tiny creature right the way through, like insects, birds, animals, anything that dies, God feels immediately the effects of that death. That's how sensitive God is. God's sensitive to the flow of this, for this life, life spirit or life force. And all of the life force comes from God. When you progress in the spirit world, when you hit the, when you make the transition between the fifteenth and the sixteenth dimension, you learn how to give this force um, to others. So you can actually create something and inject it with your own life force. Does that make sense? So you can create a living thing. Up until that point in the spirit world, you cannot create a living thing without God's help. So when before then you create in the spirit world, you might create a blade of grass, for example. It cannot be alive until God injects it with this life force. But beyond that 16th dimension, you can actually create the thing and also inject it with life yourself. That's one of the transitions that you make as you progress through the spirit world. Okay. Um, this one, of course, is the... The best one. That's why I called it the Holy Spirit. The reason why I called it the Holy Spirit is because it actually, if you think about it, makes you loving and therefore it makes you holy. If you think that all holiness is about love, then it actually helps create a holy person. And what it is, is quite simple as I've described before. So this is God. God's soul, and he is you. It is a connection that can be maintained between you and God so that love can flow. The emotion of love cannot flow between God and you without this spirit being connected, or this, it's like a tube being connected to you and God. And that's all it is. It's just a force that connects you and God together. And then love can flow. God's love can flow through that force. It doesn't have personality. It is not a person or an individual. It is a force of God. And since it's a force of God, it's controlled by God and controlled by God's laws. But it's something that's just sitting there waiting for you to make the connection to. It does have attributes, though in the sense that it can only connect to you if you're in harmony with truth and you're being humble. That's the only times that connect to you. That's the only times it can. So it's a very powerful force. The reason why it's a powerful force is this love that flows through it transforms your soul. So without, uh, without the connection to the Holy Spirit, your soul will never be transformed. So you can practice whatever you want to practice, believe whatever you want to believe, whether it's positive, negative, doesn't really matter. If you, if you do not have a connection with the Holy Spirit, you will not ever be transformed by God's love. You'll only be able to grow your own love. So it's a very powerful force. The most powerful force that I have uh, come to discover myself 
but uh, it might not be the most powerful force God has. It's just the most powerful force that I've come to discover myself. But I do suspect it is the most powerful force that God has because it's also the force, the, not, the, not the Holy Spirit, but the love is the most powerful f- thing, that feeling that God actually has. And every, every single law is inherent. Uh, love is inherent in every single law. So I feel what happens a lot of times, people get mixed up with what things are. And um, many people talk about the Holy Spirit and they say they're connected to the Holy Spirit and so forth. And what I see, instead of being connected to the Holy Spirit, you can actually often observe their connections are not with God at all, but rather a person who's in the spirit world who's giving them feelings. And, they, and most people think that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? They misinterpret what's actually happening. The reality is when this Holy Spirit makes a connection with your soul and love flows, if you're in an error-based condition, you will be absolutely overwhelmed every single time it happens. So you'll be crying uncontrollably probably every single time it happens. Right? If you're getting nice, soft, pleasant feelings from somebody, uh, that's most probably a spirit. Now, it might be a nice spirit or it might be a spirit who's feeding your addictions. But it certainly isn't going to be God. Is there any questions about that? We come down to... Oh, you've got one? But Scott, you're trying to dictate who I ask by having the microphone. I'm very tempted to take it off you. <laughs> Come down here first and then... <laughs> um, every time that you feel divine love, does it feel the same? Because I've had different experiences where I'm trying to figure out when is it divine love and when hasn't it? The reality is you'll never have to figure it out because you'll always know when okay. you're receiving it. If you're having to figure it out, there's a high likelihood there's a spirit involved in the feeling that you were experiencing. Uh, secondly, you will always be overwhelmed emotionally okay. by the experience. You will never have a, it. Will never feel like a controllable experience. Yes, I understand uh, that. Yep. Has it felt always the same though to you? Yeah. Okay. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's what I want to know. Yep. Okay. And you'll also also always be left generally with a p- feeling of peace mm-hmm. for a period of time. Mm-hmm. It may only last a day, depending on the different emotions uh-huh. that you have, of course. So it, it just depends on continual growth after that. Yep. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yep. Scott, thanks. And you can ask Thank okay. you. Yeah, I was curious. I was curious. Um, I read, recently read a book called Pranic Nourishment. Uh-huh. So what level do we have to get to we, where we can easily just live on prana? Um, well, that's, so the question you're asking is what level do you have to get to there? Well, the reality is you don't have to be very well developed to get to there. You just have to understand the flow of the energy that happens between yourself. However, to live on it, you will have to have dealt with a number of your emotions or or be fed by the addictions of spirits for a number of the emotions. And so almost everybody on the planet at the moment who lives on prana mostly is actually living through the energy of spirits. So they have high levels of spirit attachments uh, to them. When you become at one with God, you don't really think about those things anymore to be frank. You're not focused on the metaphysical anymore. You're focused on the love. And when you're focused on the love and acting in harmony with love all the time, what happens is you can survive, if you wanted to, on this maintenance energy, and you don't have to eat anything. But can you see there's still a reason why you might eat? Because things taste nice, yes? (laughs) Like uh, every time I see a mango... Whether I need to eat it or not, yeah. there's a high likelihood that mango is going down. And, uh, and so, you know, like a lot of times you'll find that you'll enjoy things far more in that place. And you won't be focused on obtaining this place for some reason. Most of the people who try to obtain that place for some reason, it's all about proof of their spirituality that they're trying to give to others. And, and that is a very fake place. And certainly not a place that allows a connection with the Holy Spirit. So, so there are many people who are connected with the pranic spirit from God, but 
but unfortunately at the same time because of their attitudes and their arrogance and so forth are nowhere near connected with the Holy Spirit mm. yep. and my suggestion is focus on the Holy Spirit first and then you know and maintaining a connection with that the other things come along but you won't be even focused on them anymore it'll be a, just a natural part of your life so when you focus on this energy and you become developed in in love then these energies you begin immediately understanding yourself does that make sense so you begin to immediately start to understand how they all work and how you can engage them and what you can do with them um, and but and you don't need to ask any questions because you have such a close connection with God about the, about the love issue that now all of this other truth can flow to you about how to utilise these other forces that God has available. What I find happening most of the time is most people are so focused on finding out about those forces and spend less of their time focusing on this one. And the reason why they do that is because this one's very fussy. Right? It requires humility and truth <laughs> before it can engage. And most people want to engage God without humility or truth. And so, so because this energy is very fussy and, and, and will only contain a certain, like a very tight definition of what, uh, wh who it can connect to, and most people avoid the connection. And so therefore they start focusing on the things they can connect to. Yeah. So, yeah. If we come down to Enrique and then back up. Yeah, just um, I'm starting to realize that the thing you said about if you seek God first, the other things are added to you. And I'm struggling with the other things, so I'm kind of finally getting it. Yeah. So I'm wondering, you've told me that I have felt God. And I'm wondering how you discern between that. And then obviously receiving divine love is obvious. But then there's the feelings you get from spirits. So I'm wondering about like the differences between those things. Well, firstly, when a person receives divine love, they can automatically sense when another person has received divine love. So, so you can automatically feel that uh, there has been an event in the other person's life where they did go through this process where they were humble and they were open to truth in that particular moment. And in that particular moment, they got very overwhelmed with emotion and were in a big mess emotionally, sobbing their heart out and in that place they had a longing for God and they received some love. And you can tell when that's happened to a person or when it has not. Secondly, if, uh, if you then compare that experience with spirit-based spirit experiences, you will find that all of the spirit-based experiences generally seem to, uh, and aside, this is aside from the spirit experiences that connect you to celestial spirits, but all of the other spirit-based experiences, which we often view as spiritual, so we, we use the term, like, a sp I had a spiritual experience. You know, an overwhelming spiritual experience is the term we use. Uh, most of the time, not a spiritual experience with God, but rather a experience with a spirit who is just a person who lives in the spirit world. It's just an individual. And here we are with our, you know, our condition and there's our soul with it, all of its own emotions. And here this spirit is, whatever it is, male or female, right? So, and it has its own condition and emotions and under certain circumstances can transmit those feelings to us. And if we have some heavy addictions in certain areas... Then, and this spirit's willing to feed these addictions in order to get something in return. That's the main reason why we feed somebody else's addiction, so that we can get something back from them. And then we will feel the sensations as a spiritual experience. <coughs> but they'll just be a simple interaction between two people. And really, in my opinion, are not very spiritual at all. In fact, if we, if we say true spirituality, I gave a talk recently about what is true spirituality... True spirituality is all about love. Yeah. That's, the, that's true spirituality. So if that's the case, then any experience that I have that's out, of, that's out of harmony with love and in harmony with my addiction is not a loving experience, even though I view it as a spiritual one. And I see most people on earth having spirit, who have spiritual experiences are not actually having loving experiences. They're having addiction experiences. And therefore, they are not spiritual experiences, 
but they can be quite satisfying emotionally. And, uh, and this is a problem that we face, I feel, on the planet, is that we're so addicted to getting the things we want inside of us met that we're not willing to examine where we're getting the feelings from. And we want to believe they're from God when a lot of times they have a lot of dark and very, um, very poor motivations in terms of love, you know, very unloving motivations. Yeah. Well, I, I get a feeling sometime like in the... And you've told me that that is receiving love from a guide. Can a lower spirit give you that feeling? Uh, uh, you will feel a similar feeling from a lower spirit. So let's describe the feeling that we're talking about for everyone. So there is at the back of your head, there's energy point entries where spirits can give you feelings. Does that make sense? Sometimes you'll feel them. Now, right now as I talk, what we'll do is we'll ask some of your guides to give you a feeling. And if you have a sincere desire to do that... Just uh, ask for your guide to give you a feeling. And what you'll feel is a lot of like a, a washing sensation coming. It feels like almost through the back of your head and starting to wash down your body. Right? It's a tingling sensation that many of you feel on a daily basis without recognising that it's a spirit, actually. Yeah? And it just is a, a very gentle, gen generally washing sensation down. Now, now, that's a feeling, and if it's a tingling sensation like that, that's a feeling of... That, can, that is a, one of two different things. Firstly, it can be a feeling of pure love that somebody is having for you in that particular moment. And your guides love you and care about you. And so, of course, there are very many times, whenever they have the opportunity, they're going to express that love to you as an emotion which has the ability to enter you and then for you to feel. So, so that's really lovely. However, many of the spirits that surround us are actually ba based, are surrounding us because of our addictions. And those particular spirits will give us the feelings that our addiction demands. And those kind of spirits will often still, we will feel it sometimes as the same sensation, but the reality is that it's just feeding an addiction. So this is where we have to be honest with ourselves. Yeah, yeah I've noticed uh, when it mostly happened was when I thought a true thought. Like I realized the truth, so I felt like that was affirmation. Yes, that's yeah. good that you've realized this truth. But lately there's been times where um, I'll ask a question and I probably don't want to know the truth. Yeah. And it, sometimes it, it coincides, maybe not that feeling, but a kind of like um, maybe like feeding my addiction to still believe the same untruth. Yes. So I'm trying to get better at discerning. Yeah, and that's a good way of discerning actually. Enrico, because it, the reality is if you look at what's happening, let's say there's our soul and it's our soul that receives every sensation and our body just reflects the sensations the soul receives. So we've got the soul of the spirit. Then obviously there is, if this spirit gives us sensations when we have the realisation of truth, then this spirit is obviously who's giving us that sensation is very much in harmony with desiring the best for us. They desire us to know the truth. They desire us to understand the truth. So that, that's an indication in that moment that that particular spirit is, who's connecting to us right in that moment is a very loving spirit who's, who's desirous of our best welfare. The, if you make the same comparison with an unloving spirit, what happens with an unloving spirit is the unloving spirit will connect to us when we have an emotion of error that we want to hold on to. Right? So we might be having a, a thought that's in error with regard to love. In other words, out of harmony with love. And that's when that spirit gives us a nice feeling. Right? And that's one quick way that we can use to test what's going on. Right? So, so if you find yourself getting a bit agitated and angry and then all of a sudden you get these feelings... Uh, from a spirit, there's a high likelihood the spirit connecting you in that moment is not one of these loving spirits, but one of these other spirits who are just wanting to feed the addiction. If you uh, having a realization of truth, and it's an overwhelming, sometimes can be overwhelming experience of a realization of truth, and you get these tingling sensations coming down the back of you, there's your spirit friend going, "You beauty, that's another one you've got," <laughs> you know, like. And, and obviously they're very, very concerned for your welfare and, and therefore very loving. Um, a few months ago, probably three, four months ago now, I gave two talks to uh, groups in England 
was in February. With February, yeah, last time we were travelling around. And uh, one of the talks was about uh, the spirit influence of guides and guardians. And another one was uh, about the spirit influence of other spirits who are not our guides and guardians. Um, and I think they're uh, just getting yeah. loaded on the net this week, actually. Mm -hmm. So when they come out, um, have, a, have a watch of those particular those particular talks because it will help you differentiate the difference between their intentions. Yeah, I think I understand that more now, but this will probably segue nicely because the last time we talked about like my feeling God, you said yes, you feel God often, but your addictions are preventing you. So if I could maybe ask about that. Because yeah. I didn't quite understand that. Yep. I'm aware of some addictions, but I have a feeling I'm not aware of all of them that pre prevent me from feeling God. Yeah, and let's get into this discussion about addictions because it's very important for your welfare, you know, in terms of getting to know and be with God. Does that make sense? If you don't understand addiction, you, you will never really understand what's going on in terms of what's preventing your soul from becoming more loving. So, so let's have a look at that. Okay, so if we look at it, and I've described this uh, many times before to many groups, so you might have seen it before in a video or something, but if we have addiction, underneath the addiction is our fear. So the first thing we need to understand about addictions is they are all constructed inside of ourselves or by others to assist us to avoid our fears. So they're a great way to get away with no longer having to feel our fears. Now, so, go on. Sorry. By def how would you, could we define addiction then as anything we have created that helps us avoid our fears? Mm -hmm. Because we gave a talk, or you gave a talk in Sweden recently, and everyone was quite confused about exactly what is an addiction. So, and and it can be physical things. So, example: let's say we wake up in the morning. Most people, when they first wake up in the morning, have had to go through a fearful experience every time they wake up in the morning. The reason why is because we're having to come from the spirit world back into our body and often around our body there are spirits that we observe that we're not too happy to see surrounding our body as we're coming back into it from asleep. The reason why we're not too, they are there is because of our soul-based addictions that we have and they feel that they can sit around and satisfy them. But many of them don't look very good. In fact, many of them look downright ugly right? and scary, actually. So there we are. We're having to come from the spirit world where we're talking with our friends or whatever in the spirit world, and we're coming back to our body, and we have to, every single time we come back to our body, we have to go through this little group of people who are surrounding us before we enter our body. And that little group of people look scary, some of them are very scary. It depends on what we've attracted in our life as to what group of people they'll be. And so we enter our body and so we're initially very afraid. So we wake up and what do we do? Usually we wake up because the alarm's gone off because we go to work or whatever. Uh, very few people wake up just naturally, you know, unfortunately. So we wake up, alarm's gone off, we've been shocked back into our body <laughs> And we've had to go through these spirits to get back into our body. We're already now quite agitated emotionally. So what's the first thing we go for? There's usually two things that we go for. Coffee and shower. What's the common denominator? <laughs> Just going for heat. <laughs> We're going for heat. Why do we go for heat? Because heat lets us get over cold. And cold is always related to fear. You know, when we get afraid, we generally feel a bit cold. And so we go for these addictions. This one, these two here are physical. They're physical in nature, addictions in the morning. Good, a good thing to try instead is you wake up in this state, 
you don't have a shower straight away and you drink water instead. See how that goes. Because most people who finish up doing that regularly find themselves connecting to quite a lot of their fear as a result because they're no longer satisfying their fear's addiction to, to have heat and to have... In coffee's case, what does it do? It also affects the nervous system quite strongly and causes you to feel like you, you jolted into activity. Yes? So there's also an addiction to being active as well that's going on. And that's more of an emotional addiction now, isn't it? Of needing that kickstart to be active and that way when you're active you can be feeling like oh let's get up and do things i feel powerful and 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 uh, and we've now just ignored the state that has been created through the the coming back to our body every single morning that's just an example now the same person wakes up in the morning and there's no coffee what happens now well, for most of the people where there's no coffee and they're used to the coffee, they go into anger. And what, what do they... Who's responsible for the shopping? <laughs> Why haven't you bought the coffee? That's what's going on with the coffee. And the anger is always the response, in this case, of the addiction not being satisfied. Now, let's define anger as also frustration, annoyance, irritation, and all those kind of emotions are all an indicator that our addictions are not being satisfied. In fact, you can use these emotions as a way to tell you things. So as soon as you feel any even irritation, you go, oh, okay, another addiction's underneath here. I wonder what that one is. Yeah. You might not know what it is at that point, but at least you know that it's there because the irritation, the annoyance, the frustration, the anger is telling you it's there. Right? And those emotions will always tell you that it's present. Yeah. If we, you had a question up there? If we can just have the mic back there. Thanks. So that means anytime you're irritated, so you're standing in line and there's five people ahead of you. And, and you're you irritated. Feel irritated. There's an addiction that's not being met. Exactly. So, so there are those things that so, we don't So, look so at. let's use the example. We're standing in line, five people, and what do we start doing? We go, they haven't got enough people serving. Don't we? So what are we starting to do straight away? We're blaming another person for the irritation that's been created, not understanding that our very soul placed us in the location, five people down the line, <laughs> waiting for somebody to come and serve us. And our very soul put us there, so our very soul must need to heal something here for to put us there. So uh, there's something inside of my condition that's drawn me to this situation and circumstance. And instead of going, oh, what's inside my condition? I'm annoyed or I'm irritated. What am I irritated about? I'm not being served. Why am I irritated about not being served? What fear do I have here or what grief do I have here that I'm covering over with this addiction that I want service right now? This is a big problem in America, by the way. Mm -hmm. You are so used to getting served very well that when you go to another country, what happens? You often get very annoyed, mm -hmm. yes, because uh, it's not the same level of service that Even you're used to. Even different parts of the country. Like exactly. If you're, you're north and you go down south and they're a little slower. Now a bit more laid back. Yeah, and you're like, what the what heck is going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then what we do is we start projecting this outwards, which is a very unloving act now. Now we're starting to project our anger to a person, to the service people, to the... And, and to be honest, if somebody was angry with you, would you serve them? Well, I don't know if I would. So how can you expect to get served by being more angry? You really can't, can you? And of course, that's going to have its own compensatory effects upon your soul the instant you start creating this. And it's all there to actually help us of, to get to the fear and the grief that's underneath our fear. 
that's what the whole event is happening for, to help us to get to those particular emotions. But what we do instead with it is we go, oh, no, 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 this is not my fault. This is the owner of this, you know, I guarantee tonight some of you are going to get into addiction with our, with our you know, meal. Right? Because, because, you know, when 40-something people rock up to a restaurant <laughs> all ordering the same kind of food or, or similar types of food, there's bound to be a problem come up that, is, that our soul attracts, yes. And uh, sooner or later, that event will trigger something emotionally. And what we do is we'll go, many of us will go, even after this discussion, we'll go into there, which is really into these feelings, right? Many of you will notice that and you'll go, okay, what's this all about? Now, what it can be about is quite simple. It could be just this feeling that I have inside of myself that I should get my needs met whenever I want them met. Now, many of us have been taught that, that we should get everything we want when we want it. Many of us bring up our own children to do that and we create little monsters rather than little children because they are all going walking around with these huge expectations that I want... Where's my iPad and where's my iPhone and where's my, you know, all these addictions are all present because we keep giving and feeding them. We keep giving everybody what they want, right? God doesn't give you everything you want. Have you noticed that? I wonder why he doesn't give you everything you want. Thank goodness he doesn't <laughs> give us everything we want. <laughs> now, he has the potential to give you everything you want. So there must be a reason why he's not doing it. And it can only be a reason to do with a lack of love inside of ourselves. So when we notice this happening, we need to see that there's an addiction in play. And once we can see there's an addiction in play, then we have this ability to start looking at what is underneath the addiction. The way you do that, though, is not intellectually. So what a lot of people do is they go, OK, I'm irritated, I'm irritated, I'm irritated... Why am I irritated? I don't like feeling irritated. Um, oh, I'll just put a smile on my face and go, how are you doing? Um, would you please be able to serve me soon? Like, instead of actually deal with the emotion, right? We, 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 we try to act our way. And I say act purposely because that's what we're really doing. We're acting differently to how we feel. How we feel is... Give me the bloody food right now. That's how we feel, right? But we're not acting that way because it's not appropriate. It's not acceptable to society to act that way. So, how, so what do we do instead? We just put on our pretty face while all this emotion is coming out of us, that other person, <laughs> right? And, and it's just coming out of us like, ah, <laughs> and, 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 we're like this at the same time, you know, trying to maintain that at the same time. And then we're wondering why the other person's not responding very well. And the reason why they're not responding very well is because, of course, they can feel all of this stuff coming out of us, not that. And, of course, that's what their soul is going to be responding to, the, the feelings that are coming out of us, not, not what we think we, we, we're portraying to them. So when we do that, we're now in this facade, we're now acting. And, of course, when you start acting... What do you find? Things don't go as well, generally, as what you had hoped. And that's definitely usually the case with most of these situations. Instead, what we need to do is we need to stop for a moment. And even if it meant walking outside and getting to be last in the line again, rather than projecting all of this unloving crap at other people, we need to then feel about why am I so irritated? The way you do it is this. If the emotion is that you feel is irritation, then what you do is you sit down and you feel irritated. You don't go, oh, my, I'm irritated. I can see I'm irritated. You actually sit there and feel irritated. Right? You've removed yourself from the environment so nobody else needs to feel the terrible projections coming out of you, and you're sitting there feeling the feeling. You know that it has to do with an addiction not being met. 
So what you try to do then is feel the addiction. You don't need to tell yourself about the addiction. You just feel the addiction. The way you feel the addiction is feel irritated as much as you're able and the addiction will rear its ugly head soon afterwards if you allow the feeling of the irritation to just be with you. The addiction will become present soon afterwards. Once the addiction is present, you can feel the addiction. Does, it, does anyone know what it means to feel the addiction? I badly want to be bloody served. <laughs> so that's feeling the addiction. Does that make sense? I want to be served and you're not serving me in the right time frame. So all this dialogue can be going inside of you while you're sitting outside on the curb, <laughs> letting yourself feel what's going on. You could feel this, oh, I want to be served, what's going on here? What, what? And, and feel that frustration, let yourself feel it. Stop telling yourself that you don't have any. Stop telling yourself that everything's fine. Stop telling yourself that you're going to be a nice, loving person while you have all of these emotions coming out of you. Because that's all just fake stuff that needs to be thrown away from your life, really. You need to let yourself feel what's really there. Mm. Yeah. Can I add yeah. to that? Yeah. yeah. What I've found is that initially there's all the facade, as in... I'm not actually angry I'm, or I can talk my way out of this anger by just understanding the whole... So it's facade and I'm trying to be very nice, so the place that AJ is describing. Then um, I feel there's another place that we go to where we go, no, I'm angry and I have a right to be angry because this is wrong and these are the two places we kind of live in in most of our life. We go either, no, I'm not angry, I'm a nice person and anger is bad or actually I am angry now and I should be able to be angry. And the other person deserves my anger. They're doing the wrong thing. Any rational person would see that this is a bad situation and I should be able to be angry. What it's like for, to actually experience an addiction and release it is to let yourself, as AJ said, really want the thing that you want. So, like, we often relate it to a physical addiction, like coffee or a substance or something or a food, because it actually does feel. If you've ever craved something that you can't have physically, it feels like a very similar feeling when you can't have an emotion, emotional addiction met. Mm. It's it feels like no, I want you to validate me as a person. I want to feel like a special person. I want you to make me feel safe in this situation. That kind of feeling. That's what it's like to experience the addiction emotionally. It's very painful. You feel like there's a deep need in you that is not being met. And, and maybe if we compare it with like it's the same process as if let's say you're addicted to coffee in the morning. You would just sit there with the coffee cup right there brewed <coughs> right? Smelling it. Smelling. <laughs> all up there, right? So you just sit there and you just look at the coffee cup and feel like how much you want that coffee. <laughs> right? And just feel how much you want it without actually taking it. You see? And, and this is why I say that dealing with addictions is the biggest work you're going to do on this path. Because especially in the West, we have so many addictions. We are t and we are totally grown up with the feeling that they're normal and that's normal life and you should be able to get things and when we don't have like it's we're so adverse to the pain of not having that thing that it, that's why we always put anger on top of the addiction level <laughs> of, of what happens because most of us just get angry and it's actually being brave enough to go through the pain of, like, of the anger. Because the anger actually, when you're, when you're owning the anger, it feels very painful. Like, no, <laughs> it's a hurting kind of anger. Mm -hmm. And then, then there is the feeling of recognising emotionally. And this is why AJ really stressed the emotional part of it. Because many people, when they learn this little flow chart, they go, OK, I'm irritated. What am I afraid of? And then we can tell ourselves a really big story that kind of, feels okay for us of what we might be afraid of or the grief that we might have something we might have missed out on in our childhood and it's just a totally intellectual exercise i've tried it it totally doesn't work and most of the time you've come up with the wrong thing it's yeah. usually completely in the wrong field ballpark or even in the wrong universe <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's that far away yeah <laughs> yeah uh and 
it's only been through feeling this feeling of I really want what I want and then the pain of, oh, I can't, if I'm going to be loving, I can't get what I want. And that's an emotional place as well. Because intellectually, we know at the beginning, I'm angry, okay, I know that's not loving. We, we, know, the, we know the talk by now, most of us. But, but getting to an emotional place with this process is firstly feeling the pain of I want what I want and, and then the pain of oh, if I want God or if I want to be loving, I can't get this thing that I really want. And once those two things are actually experienced, then we get closer to the fear. Mm. Not before then. And that's why it's so important, this, this bit, I feel. Yeah. yeah. So um, maybe if I ask you a few questions about your own progress in the last four years. <laughs> I feel like I've got a PhD in addiction. <laughs> so <laughs> AJ kind of lived his life very ethically and morally, so he didn't have that many. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had a few, but, you had some, but they but all seemed like to me. get squashed when my entire life fell apart and nobody wanted to spend any time with me anymore. <laughs> so you grieved them <laughs> all at once. I had to grieve them all at once. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know how you said how earlier you said how the your addictions have been the biggest work you've had to do. Um, can you give an illustration of some of those particular things that that where you've noticed them, where you where you had physical addictions associated with emotional addictions and then what what actually got triggered in your life and how they come out uh yeah <laughs> yeah and what i've realized is every single physical addiction i had was really just a mask for a deep emotional addiction that i had so um in the beginning i had i, w I, had, I was addicted to coffee uh food and i didn't mind the occasional drink or three either. So <laughs> all of these things to help me kind of numb out and get away from myself. Um, you and also kept yourself quite busy most of the time, didn't yes, you? Yes, I liked exercise, I worked a lot, I was also studying a master's and yeah, and all of these things were quite socially acceptable in the sphere I was in. Um, everyone went to work, started their day with coffee and then we were all busy all day and then we, you know, talked about what we were studying and, the, you know, so there was a lot of, um, mm. it was all seemingly socially acceptable but it really was the basis of my life. Then I met AJ probably and um, realised intellectually, hmm, there's a lot of things off and I don't actually know myself and I can't actually feel myself. Uh, and so then I started the process and even just through engaging a relationship with him, obviously, most of my addictions were challenged uh, emotionally now. So, because underneath all these physical addictions, I had a... I think I uh, shared with the group in Gothenburg, my four major addictions were um, being approved of. So, I got a lot of that fulfilled through my lifestyle um, and my family unit. Um, so, when I met AJ, um, my whole basis for my life was kind of challenged and my family was very challenged so immediately approval was very challenged everyone I knew kind of went what's happening with you you're a bit weird and my family went if you go down this path we can't accept you anymore so that was approval out uh, do you remember all safety was another mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. control and a feeling of basically which is related to control it's about sanity really and this is probably the one I'm still working through. <laughs> I really think it's not an addiction to feel sane. I like that <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, yeah. um, I should probably clarify that. <laughs> anyway. She's um, totally insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my fear. Yeah. Uh, so I guess in giving up, I gave up uh, alcohol, coffee, chocolate, Oh, well, chocolate, okay, that's still on the way out. But uh, <laughs> alcohol and coffee were out the window pretty quickly. But what was left over was all this feeling like I need to be in control of my life. I need to feel safe. And I want, I, I, now that my dad has left my life, I really want you to make me feel like I'm okay in every way as a woman. And so lots of things happened there where obviously that addiction wasn't being met in the way I wanted it to be, which was very controlled. Um, and so lots of anger. Just That's why we always talk about how angry I've been for two years because really that was me just engaging this process. And um, I see that 
there's a lot of, um, like I feel quite lucky actually that my soulmate is Jesus. And so when I met him, he really challenged every single addiction I had. And he, it kind of, because I wanted to be with him, that forced me into this process that I f- see lots of people kind of dancing with. And that they talk about, oh, I can see this addiction, I'll challenge that one. And I can see their whole life and I go, well, would you like, like we could, I could sit down and tell you what I can see is really controlling your life. Um, but you'd probably be incredibly challenged and, you know, just as I was and be angry for a couple of years. Um, mm. So that's the level of commitment I think it takes is being willing to see it in every sphere of your life. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, because yeah. it's quite good sometimes to res- to hear practical circumstances. And, and it's like, um, with, for example, with the safety issue. Mm-hmm. Of course, when Mary met me, at that time her parents were attacking me. Um, or soon after her parents were attacking me. Um, she was worried about public perception so much that... Here's a guy who's saying he's Jesus. He's not going to, in her mind, he's not going to attract very nice people around him. And I think all of you are lovely, so I I don't know whether that's true. (laughs) I I think you're all beautiful (laughs) now. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I didn't before, but I was worried. Mary's original opinion was he's not going to attract very nice people. Uh, They're going to be people who want to attack him all the time and and, uh, pretty annoyed with him all the time and so forth. And and, uh, which is basically just transposing what my parents felt yeah. about him onto everyone. And yeah. so I wasn't... Just my existence didn't make her feel safe in her life. And so then it was like, how can you control me so that your existence was safer, wasn't it? Like, yeah. So there was all sorts of things there. So if we started... We, let's say we were home and we started having a conversation... Um, with a group of people and they start asking me questions about what it's like to live in the spirit world, Mary would say, who wants a cup of tea? <laughs> like right at that moment, you know, the critical juncture where somebody's <laughs> just asked the question and all of a sudden Mary's going, well, Where, where's a cup of tea? What do you want? You know, and of course everyone would get totally distracted, which was, which was really? the reason why she was doing it, of course. And and then I would bring that up and say, Mary, you're doing the same thing again. And then, of course... And then there's <laughs> the pain. I really want to wa- have what I want. Yeah. 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 And so that's the time to feel the addiction. How much you want it. Yeah. Uh, how much you want it met. Yeah. How badly it's... It, how, how it's right there in you and you just want it so badly met. And, and if you allow yourself to, to just sit with that feeling... You will actually feel it. You'll feel that addiction. And wha- as you feel the addiction, what will happen is that you'll start feeling the emotion of the addiction itself, like how, wha- how badly you want it. And the why you want it that badly starts coming up with the feeling. It just does as soon as you really engage yeah. that process. So, yeah. and, and this is a, bu- a fundamental principle that we need to understand with all of your emotions. Feelings are over the top of feelings. Now, that might sound like a funny statement, but many of you think that thoughts are over the top of feelings. And in between feelings. And in between feelings. And you believe you can think your way into your feelings. And you can't. You can only feel your way into your feelings. You can't think your way. So, so while it's important for you to understand when your feelings are illogical, because that's very important to understand, and we'll talk about that in a minute a little, it's import- more important for you to understand that above, over the top of your fear are the feelings of your addictions. Over to- top of your grief is the feelings of your fear. Not thinking about your fear, but feeling the fears. And over the top of the fears are the feelings of the addictions. And if you do not get the addictions met, you will also have another feeling, which is this. The anger, the irritation, frustration, which is another feeling. They're all feelings. If you tell yourself that you can think yourself into your fear, and many of you attempt this, 
And, and uh, if we be more accurate, many of the men in the audience think that they can avoid their grief and they can't. And many of the women in the audience think they can avoid their fear and they can't. Right? So what we try to do is this. We see our addiction here, here, we don't feel it. We, we see our addiction and then we go, okay, that addiction's there because, oh, yes, I can sort of feel that little bit of that feeling of that fear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over that fear altogether and just cry about something. And do you know what you'll be actually doing? You won't be crying about anything to do with what created your fear. You will actually be crying about not getting your addiction met, which is actually more of an anger than a grief. Right? And then, of course, in that place where you're avoiding your grief and you're avoiding your fear, now you get a heap of spirits over the top of you as well going, yeah, 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 let's get into that. And now you've got lots of lots of spirits around you all encouraging you to avoid these emotions. And why are they encouraging you to avoid those emotions? Because they're the emotions they use to control you. And they want you to avoid those emotions because while you avoid those emotions, they are able to control you. Right? And in your anger, they can control you. And in your frustration and annoyance and irritation, they can control you. But when you're actually in the experience of the emotion, now nobody around you can control you. Now you have self-determination. Now you have control of your own life. So this is important to understand. If we can have right up the back uh, on this side there. Yeah. If you keep your hand up there, that's it. No, right up the back, sorry. Right up oh. the back, sorry. No, I need the microphone uh, because we're recording it. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, this is my my name is Mariam. This is first time I'm I'm coming to your meetings. I'm actually actually enjoying it very much. I do have a little problem understanding what you're saying about um, your thoughts and your feelings are different, and I think it's your feelings are the outcome of your thoughts, and your soul kind of packages up, if I want to make it in a very simple way of saying it, yep. since human uh, is made of, as you said, is, is your spirit, is your soul, and of course the shell is the body. So if, if the spirit is what connected to God, as you said earlier, and your soul being your feelings, your fears, your anger, it also com combines with your thoughts and then ha that's how it reflects on that shell, which is your body. And I, I guess that's the part I'm not understanding exactly. Well, what I'm saying is the real you is your soul, and it's only your soul that can connect to God. Via the Holy Spirit. So Via the, spirit, the Holy Spirit. The, the spirit that AJ spoke of earlier is not... That's not your spirit body. Your spirit body is a part of you, and it's actu an actual genetic structure that is connected to... So that's your spirit body and that's your physical body. Your soul controls both bodies. And in your soul are the emotions. All right? let me, just let me finish. And in your soul are all your beliefs and so forth. And it's your soul that controls what you think, not the other way around. That's fine, but it still is that the, the thoughts and your soul is separated from the spirit. Because no, the no, spirit is a whole No, you're confusing what I'm trying to show you. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit, which is God's, which is just a force. It's not a person, it's not an identity, it's nothing related to you at all. This spirit body is your spirit body. When you die, this is the body you will use after you die. This body here, that's your spirit body. So it's better to call that a physical structure that exists in the spirit world. It's, a, it's an actual body. In that body is your mind. So your actual mind's there. But your soul controls what your mind even thinks. 
It's your emotions that control it. Now, let, let me give you some examples of this. I can present two different people with exactly the same circumstance and they will think two different things. Now, surely, if it's exactly the same circumstance and the, the most logical thing would be the two people would actually think the same thing. But why do they think something different? The reason why they think something different is they have both had a different experience of those events in the past. And because of the emotions, it generates a series of thoughts that are dependent upon the emotions that exist within them. Right? Now, all of us are individuals and eventually we'll have our own thoughts without being dictated by unhealed emotions. But unfortunately on earth, if you present, and this is the situation I'm trying to describe, is you present two different people with the same event, right, in the same way, the two different people, if they were in harmony with love and truth, would surely have a similar response to the same event if they were in harmony with love and truth. If they were in harmony with God's way of thinking, they would have a similar response. So let me give you a real life example. There's a man who's a soldier and he's standing here and there's a man here who's a pacifist and he's standing here. They're presented with the same event. The towers in New York get flown into with aeroplanes and three and a bit thousand people die. Same event. What causes their reaction to that event? It's not the event. There's some, the event's just a trigger to their reaction, but it's not the cause. What causes their reaction is their belief systems, their emotions. Now, the soldier may have a feeling, I want to go to war with these bastards that, that did this. Does that make sense? The pacifist might have the feeling, ah, oh, this is all a part of the creation of the world around us and what's going on out of harmony with love, and I'm still going to stay in harmony with love. I'm still going to love the world and the people in the world and the, even the people who I feel caused the event. They're having two completely separate reactions to the same trigger and there can only be one reason why. And that is, they have different feelings about that trigger. Right? And those different feelings trigger different thoughts and also trigger different actions. Right? In the first century I said these words which you would have heard many times, out of the heart's abundance the mouth speaks. What did I mean by that? I meant this. That whatever is in your heart will dictate what you speak about, what you think about, how you act, what you do with your life. It's what is in your heart that will determine that. Right? And so two people can have different things in their heart, their soul, same, same thing, I'm referring to the heart and the soul interchangeably. Two different people can have different emotional beliefs, different emotional feelings, and they will respond differently to exactly the same situation because of that. One might respond very unlovingly, the other respond very lovingly. Now, of course, in responding lovingly, there are many options we can take that are all possibly loving. Right? So I'm not saying that every person will do exactly the same thing. What I'm saying is there is a time when we choose to act unlovingly in comparison to choosing to act lovingly. And that is going to be very dependent upon what is inside of us emotionally, inside of our soul. That is what's going to dictate our behaviour. That is what's going to dictate our words. It's also going to dictate our thoughts, what is inside of our soul. Right? And our soul will allow the thoughts that the soul feels attracted to. And the soul will automatically disallow thoughts that it does not feel attracted to. Right? 
So an event such as the event in New York occurred and many people in the USA, how did they react to this event? In anger, which tells me that they have an addiction not being met. And what's the addiction? To feel safe. To feel safe. That's the addiction. And it's not being met, so what are they willing to do? They are willing to respond in anger, to, in extreme anger, by sending an entire force over to another country, even. Right? That's a response in anger to an event that we're unwilling to feel the addictive emotion about. Right? If we were willing to feel the addiction, what would we have done? We'd feel how unsafe we felt. Right? And that's feeling the fear. And if we feel how unsafe we felt, it's highly likely at some point during the feeling of this fear, we'll get down into the grief and we'll have a big cry about the loss of life, the big cry about how unsafe we felt, feel, how on our own soil events are now happening, which potentially threaten our life or the, the life that we've come to know and we'd feel about those particular events. Once we've released that grief, would we be inclined to go into violence? No. Because we've actually removed from ourselves, the soul, the trigger of the thought to go to war. Right? And so without feeling these things, you're not going to change. You can try to change, but it's not going to be very easy unless you feel these things. Questions? I could run down just for. Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, that mic's not working now, so we'll I'll just, just have get to. Some batteries, maybe. Batteries are probably gone on it. Um, if we bring the other microphone down. Yeah, then I'll just swap them. Uh, that would be good. Oh, no. It's just muted, I think. Far away, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, I recently made a decision to leave my marriage, mm -hmm. and I moved out of the house, and it is challenging one of my biggest addictions of having a man to make me feel safe. Yep. Um, and so living by myself, I feel tremendous amounts of fear. Yes. Um, so my question is, do I just continue to engage the fear daily and feel it and eventually that I'll fall into my grief? Yes. Or am I really just s trying to stay in the fear and not feel, like Mary said, that, that trap door? Well, if you feel about the events that have happened recently for yourself, you can see how there's still this tendency to try to want another man yes. to get the fear yes. met. Does that make sense? Right. So if you, if you allow yourself to think about that, you've got the fear being triggered. The man is not meeting my security. I haven't a man around me meeting my security feelings and so forth. So that it's being triggered in that moment. What you hap what happened is you reverted back to trying to get your addiction met right. immediately. Yes. Right? This is a normal way we deal with our fears. We, mm -hmm. we go, oh, I can't feel that, I can't feel that. Let's go and get the addiction met now and, and then I'll feel good again. Right. And then when we feel good again, we feel like, oh, I've satisfied myself. Oh, I, I don't have that fear anymore. It, and, it's, and it's completely erroneous we obviously do right. have the fear we're just we're just calming it down with our addiction yes so so instead of doing that you start feeling the fear so you feel it and you'll feel it in your body mm -hmm. and if you really like let shaking. yourself you you yeah shaking you'll feel the fear itself your body will start shaking you you wake up in the morning feeling the fear every morning for a period of time see most people can't cope with that most people don't have the desire even to cope with that for any reason so what they do is they wake up shaking the first thing they reach for is a coffee coffee to calm them down the cigarette which will make that go away and you know all of these different things which will help them shut down the entire process if we instead of doing that we engage the process so we engage this process that God's led us to so we engage this process of feeling this fear and every day we persist feeling it so 
So let's say one week's gone past, and every day that week we've woken That's up. That's how it has been. Exactly. One week. <laughs> yeah, one, week yeah, one week. One week's not very long, by the way. No, I know. <laughs> but when you're in fear, it feels, it feels like, like a, a long time. A yes? year. Yeah. So, you know, if we compare one week with the whole of our life, you know, it's not a very long period of time. And most people are not willing to endure fear for one week. That's the reality. You look at our society, most people are not willing to endure fear for one hour let alone one week, you know. So, so, And if you stay in this feeling of the fear and let your body feel it, you know, you start shaking and all these other things. And what do other people do? Well, they may try to make you feel better, but a lot of times when they start seeing this, <laughs> What's wrong what with do you, you feel? <laughs> yeah, drug them. You want them to stop, you know, they're triggering your fear, aren't they? <laughs> and so, of course, you want them to stop, right? <laughs> and, and, and as a result of that, you can't cope. Another person who's also in fear can't s cope with seeing you in fear. And so what they do is that all around you, they start going, what are you in fear? What's wrong? You need to go to the doctor. You need to sort this out. You need to go and get antidepressant medication, whatever is going on for you. And they get a lot, you get a lot of pressure on them, which, which instead of actually lessening your fear, even makes it more strong, obviously. And if you allow that process to continue, many of your fears actually will start coming up in the process just by you allowing yourself to feel it. Just one fear, you're feeling one, and now everyone around you is in panic of what kind of thing they're feeling, how it, how it affects them and all those kind of things, what you're going to do with it. And as a result, they become more traumatised and then there's extra fear that comes your way of now you're potentially losing relationships, losing friends. All these things come up automatically because we have so much society-based pressure to be nice and safe and calm. Right? And it's also bringing up so many of my other addictions. Of course. By getting rid of this one major addiction, Yes. all of a sudden I'm aware of all these other addictions exactly. and now I'm in fear about all of them uh, okay. on top of it. Yeah. So. The fear time is a very unpleasant time. I, I must agree with you. It's a very difficult time to go through. And many people endure a few days of it and then boom, they're out and back into their old life again because they don't want to go any further than that. They don't want to actually feel their way through it all. The, re the reality is if you've had, say, 30 years of life, let's say, and in that life... In those 30 years, some quite emotionally fearful events must have occurred, right? If you think about your life. And depending on where you live, some of you have lived in other countries that are, you know, potentially even more fear-based fear societies or, or the fear has been expressed outwardly more, then potentially there's, there's quite a lot of fear inside, right? So, so there's 30 years of this life. Do you think that 30 years of fear is going to be able to be felt in one week. No, no, I guess th that wasn't my expectation. It no, 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 it's not yours. I felt um, as a result of feeling all this fear yep. and also a desire to not want to engage my addictions any longer, yep. that I feel almost shut down emotionally, mm. that I can't cry about it. Yeah, you but I mean? you're yeah. shut down emotionally because you're not feeling your fear. Okay, yeah. and and that's what I wanted to say. I feel that between this point and this point, the true transition, there is a kind of grief. <laughs> and for me, it's kind of like a grief of... It's surrendering the old way, which is this way, <laughs> and it's an emotional realisation that's not going to work anymore. Yeah. And and that I'm going to have to go this way. Right. And that's the biggest decision I think any of us ever make. So maybe that's where I am, instead <laughs> of in the fear that I'm in that in-between. Yeah. yeah. I don't feel you've grieved, like, letting go of addiction as a... It's like a... Um, what does it feel like to me? Like a fallback position, you know, or like a last resort phone a friend <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go back to addiction <laughs> you know yes there's a point where there's a grief where you or a, or a pain where you realize I can't do that anymore and the only way left is down this rabbit hole mm -hmm. and and that is a very scary painful place mm -hmm. and most of us 
I feel and what I did for a long... I feel I'm actually at this place right now, this gut r grinding, wrenching, I have to go this way because it's too painful to go this way yes. anymore. Um, but for a long time, I danced between these two places. Yeah. Touch a bit of fear. Oh, I'm processing fear. It's okay. But next thing you know, I'm right. back in an addiction. And it kind of... I can feel I wasn't myself like wanting to go back to addiction. Yes. Just wanting it. And, that and uh, like I said, you know, even in the last few weeks, you, there's been times when you have. Yes. Right. So that's an Very indication. Much. And as Mary is saying, when you fully grieve the addiction itself, when you fully feel it and grieve it, you will get to a point where you acknowledge the fear and you want to feel the fear itself. Mm, okay. At that point is the time when you'll start feeling the fear properly and you will not revert to addiction. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. You, in, when you get to that place, you won't go back to the addiction, so you won't cycle. Because my it's soul like, has it's made like that decision. It's Your not an option choice, anymore. Yes. Th yeah. Those two, it's gone. Okay. Yeah. And you're just sitting it on the cliff face going, <laughs> oh. You know, it's like standing on a cliff face, <laughs> diving off, and then wondering what's going to happen. Yes. Like, And that sensation, you know that sensation you have physically sometimes of falling? Yes. You know how some, some people feel quite freaked out about that sensation, like when you go on a theme park ride or something like that and you have mm -hmm. that sensation. And that's the sensation emotionally when you actually confront the fear. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. It's like an emotional realisation that that's what you've got to do and you've got no idea how it's going to turn out. Yeah. Now, most people want to have an idea of how it's going to turn out. This is why we That's ask a lot addiction. of questions. <laughs> yeah. This totally. is why we ask a lot of questions about our emotional process because we actually want to know in advance what it's going to feel like before we feel it. I very much do. I know yeah. that. Yeah. And then we'll be safe. <laughs> and of course, safe control fear always. didn't get in you because you were safe. It got in you because you were unsafe. Mm -hmm. So you're going to feel unsafe processing it. That's the reality. You are going to feel it. Pain... The pain of fear is going to be certain. You're going to f have to feel it, and it, it's going to be a certain pain that you definitely feel. You can't avoid it. And, and when we talk about it all the time, we're avoiding it. Right? We're, we're attempting to use words to try and make ourselves feel, ah, 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 now I can handle that. Right? But when the reality is to feel fear, you've got to feel like you can't handle it and actually go through that feeling. So, so it's actually counterintuitive what we're trying to do. You see? We're choosing to feel out of control. Yes. Our fear. yes. Yeah. We're choosing to feel out of control by feeling our fear. And everything inside of us is screaming at us, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And yet we still do it. And once you get into that place where you choose to do it, you will never revert to your addiction again. Does that make sense? Never. You won't be drawn back into the addictive behaviour again. So, f for example, with regard to this thing with men, you will never enter into a relationship again with a man after you choose to feel this fear. You might not have felt it all fully yet, mm -hmm. but once you choose to feel it, you will never enter a relationship with a man again based on wanting safety, ever. That seems very worth it. Well, it's definitely worth it, isn't it? Because then, it, uh, obviously, it's going to have to be based on some other things, like sex or other... No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> on my other addictions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, other addictions. <laughs> what we need to do, obviously, is we deal with the different <laughs> addictions, right? And then, and then what happens is we have a pure desire that comes out of us to love. And that, that of course, will then drive all of our actions. That's and the help beauty. attract our soulmate. Of course. It will uh, attract our soulmate. We have a longing for our soulmate during, uh, during that process as well. And, and I see... You understand too that while this fear exists within you, desire will be very difficult. In other words, you will not even feel your desires correctly mm -hmm. while this fear is within you. Because unfortunately, while it's within you, it's screaming at you going, meet my addiction, meet my addiction, meet my addiction, meet my addiction. And as it's doing that, this constant meet my addiction thing with you, What's happening is you don't have any space left inside of you to feel a desire. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But when you let go of this fear, all of a sudden, the amazing thing about it, you don't even have to have felt it all yet. You're just even acknowledging its existence. You start also noticing desires that you had that you never noticed before. Things that are a part of what you want to fulfill in your life that you never even thought about before.
-hmm. And the reason why you never thought about them, because to even to think about them caused you to be afraid. And so you didn't even want to think about them. And this is what I'm saying. It's the soul's feelings that control even what you think about. For many of, many of you are yet to engage your pure desires because your fear prevents you from even acknowledging what they are. That's the irony. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is where why fear is such an important emotion to address emotionally. Because if we don't address it, we'll never know what we truly want. Mm. Yeah. You say? Uh, just that that's been my experience, absolutely. And um, just by almost, almost making, I'm on the decision point of fear and there's no way back, all this desire has just rushed into me for life and living and a kind of joy that I, have, I can't remember having for 33 years. Um, and... Yeah, it's this very beautiful place, even though it's gut-wrenching. There's this, this energy in me that wasn't there before, this joy. And, and I feel the magic of this place is because desire starts to come then, if we act on those desires, then it helps us in the fear process as well. It'll trigger the fear, but also there's a joy in doing a desire that's more pure now. And yeah, so it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. And where I see a lot of women getting stuck in their own development is with fear. So, so because there's been a lot of fear for women historically, you know, you, you, historically women have often been abused and attacked and controlled by men, controlled by the environment. There are now a lot of women spirits who are in terrible fear, influencing the next generation of women. And a lot of women do not believe that we will ever be able to feel and process through any of their fears. The problem with that state is, firstly, it's not true. You will be able to do it. But secondly, you'll never really recognise your desires unless you do it. That's the sad part. For a lot of men, it's not uh, so much their fear that they're worried about. Many men do bodily experience their fears, but they have huge trouble with grief. So in other words, there's fear about expressing grief. And for many men, it's, it's the grief that will heal them um, but they avoid their grief in lots and lots of different ways. With sex is one way, uh, pornography is another way, all ways to avoid their grief. The, so the grief inside of the men uh, is what the men need to allow themselves to start feeling their fears about, what, what beliefs they have about their, their grief. For women, it's the beliefs about your fear that you have that are preventing you from feeling your fear. And, uh, and that's a very big thing that needs to be focused on and felt. And this is why, you remember the channeling last night that Mary did? I feel this is very important for many of you here because if you look at those women, they taught themselves that they had no fear. Mm. They eventually got to the point, using their mind, they got to the point where they believed they didn't have any fear anymore. And they were sitting there in the spirit world, in the first dimension of the spirit world, stagnant because they believed they didn't have any fear anymore. When, when we started talking, you could list, many of you would have observed through the discussion how many fears they had, yes? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and as I'm listing these different fears, they've got this agitation coming up and this panic feeling coming up. That's the feeling that needs to be felt. And when that feeling is addressed and felt, then you don't have a prevention of grief. Mm. Right? Now, many of you ladies will find grief, in comparison to men, you'll find grief very easy to feel. Unfortunately, though, you have a desire to only feel your grief and to not feel your fear. And that is what prevents your true grief from actually rising. Because remember, we have a feeling over a feeling. Mm. So the feeling of fear is the feeling that's over the top of your grief. If you do not embrace the feeling of fear, you will never get to the accurate emotion of your grief that will heal you. So, so you need to address this issue with fear. And so do men, of course. Men have different fears, though, than most of you. Men, men are not waiting for another man, man, generally, to come along and rescue them, <laughs> for example. That's a, it's a very 
definitely a woman feeling, isn't it, that most women seem to have in relationship where they want the man to provide security. The men are sort of used to going out and providing security, so they, they don't have that fear. They might have a fear, though, of not having a job or, you know, they have other fears that, that, they, that they will need to address. But they're very different fears between the genders. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Sure. So um, during this process, I've had a lot of anger at my mother mm -hmm. because of her belief system about men and what she um, modeled yeah. for me. Yeah. Is that just me trying to, again, rationalize my addiction? Or is that, you know, uh, is that just feeling... I don't. I it confu I get a little confused in there with that feeling. With her. the reason why you're asking the question is because you're not prepared to fully feel your anger with your mother. Mm. Okay. Right now, if you have anger with your mother, feel your anger with them. You don't have to act upon it. Feel it. You need to feel it. When you feel it, you'll understand what it's about. What 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 the feeling is. Will t the feeling will tell you what it's all about. But a lot of the times we go, oh, but she's my mother. So we have a whole set of addictive belief systems about mothers that we don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. And particularly if we have children of our own, we think, I don't want to feel that about my mother because what if my children have to feel that about me? You know, then we start getting really complicated mm -hmm. about feeling our emotions. If you allow yourself to just feel what is present, feel the anger that you have with your mother, feel it, you will soon, through the feeling of it, find out what it's about. But if you don't feel it and you shut it down because you've got judgment about it or you've got some other emotion going on about it, then you will not know what it's about. And then you'll go into this place of, oh, should I feel it? Shouldn't I feel it? What do I do? Right. And this is where we ask the questions. We ask the questions because there is a fear involved. So the question then becomes, what is your fear about expressing anger or feeling your anger about your mother? Because it has to be a fear stopping you from feeling it. That she was a victim. That it's not. It's, it's not it's her not fault. It's not righteous. It's not of me. It's not her fault. Yeah. So, so you're justifying her bad behaviour towards yourself by saying, but it wasn't her fault. She was a victim of other circumstances, and and that is a great way to avoid your own pain about how she treated you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And this is what we do. We we constantly go to the anger because we're avoiding the addiction and the fear. The addiction here is, I want to believe my mother is a good mother. Or at least if she has been a bad mother, I want to believe she didn't do it on purpose. Right. Yes? Yeah, or I, I don't want to feel guilty because I, I'm blaming her for having a hard life. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you can, just as a side note, if you can feel the anger, of, at the moment you feel angry at her, or you're not letting yourself feel it, but you feel angry at her for what she taught you, if you can connect to the anger you have about what she didn't teach you, like, mm. there's, that's, yeah. That's where the grief that's is, you see. Yeah. 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 And you can see, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, when we focus on one thing, um, we, we don't have any emotional response inside of us. And then we focus on the other thing and instantly there's an emotional <laughs> response, right? And, and that tells us, you know, what we're afraid of doing. We're, you're afraid of acknowledging all the things you didn't get from your mum. That you want. And still want, actually. <laughs> yeah. And still, the reason why you're angry with her is because you still want it so much, you want her to do it that's even my now. That's addiction. <laughs> that's your addiction. You've got quite it? a list going now. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. We all do. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Pleasure. Both of you. Just hand the microphone straight behind. Um, AJ, I wonder if you would address the, the addiction that so many of us have, which is to um, money and work and the fear that, you know, you and I talked about this yesterday this fear that if I don't have a job, what am I going to do? So we will prostitute ourselves in our jobs just so that we can avoid the fear of not having it. Yeah. Um, certainly, but there's a lot, <laughs> so I don't know if we get time to address them all, <laughs> because the, the reality is in the, our addictions with money are fascinating, because there are literally so many underlying reasons why we have them in place, and, and, and I find it a very fascinating discussion when you start really analysing deeply what's going on with people and their belief about their job and money and income, and, and there are just so many 
addictive emotions we have in play with money that, uh, th that in fact, if you focus on some of them, you'll learn a lot about yourself and a lot about life generally if you do. So let's list some, shall we? Just to get ourselves started. <laughs> the easiest way to deal with any of our fears, if we're discussing them, is to go, okay, what would happen if I had none? So what would happen if you had no money? So let's make a list. What would happen if there was no money? If you had no money? But the rest of the world has money. And the rest of the world relies on money. What would happen if you have none? So you can't pay your rent. So what would happen there? You, lose your house. You, 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 you won't have a place, no place to live. You have to buy food, do you not? Yeah. So no, <laughs> nothing to eat. Nothing to wear. So you have to walk around naked. Not much good, right? Particularly if you're a bit worried about that. What else? You can't pay the bills. What happens when you can't pay bills? People will not only bother you. What do they do? They they sue you. They they take and there's a problem of a potential of prison. Right, right, right. And and when we start talking about prison, most of us get freaked out there, right? Right. Who knows what's going to happen to us in prison, right? Right. We have nothing to drink either. Of course, that's going to last about. You know, a few days. Fortunately, uh, oxygen is still free. <laughs> so you'll at least be able to breathe until you die of... Dehydration. Dehydration. <laughs> yeah. So death. Death is a fear. <laughs> All right. It? So death is another fear that comes up. Like, obviously, if none of these things happen, there's the potential of death. Right. And by the way, what's death? The complete ending of everything in <laughs> existence. <laughs> Isn't that what every, most people believe? Like that, it means that uh, that's the worst possible thing that could happen to you. Right? During this phase, you're going to have a lot of emotional turmoil and physical pain, are you not? While all of these things are happening. So you've got some physical pain you're going to have to I endure. And emotional turmoil. And then on top of that... What will everybody think of you? Humiliation. Right, so you will, yes, so let's list some of those. So on top of that, you're going to be humiliated. Everyone's going to enjoy uh, humiliation. Everyone's going to enjoy how you had a happy life and now you've got a terrible one. <laughs> right? They might judge me for being lazy or... Um, judgment, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, there's this feeling in many people that anybody that has a bad luck deserves it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're now uh, dependent mm -hmm. on other people's generosity. Dependent. Dent. I Dent. think it's E. Or Sorry? burden. You're now, yes, potentially a burden. Can you start seeing that already a lot of these feelings are exactly the feelings your dad and mum projected at you at different times in your life, right? Mm -hmm. That you're a burden and when you did something wrong, you should be humiliated for it so that that's the way they correct you and that you deserve th their beltings, mm -hmm. right? And all these kind of things all come from, uh, very much come from our uh, childhood oftentimes. Now, you've only begun in this list, by the way, because there's a whole, have you got all those? Everyone's got those? Yeah? So it's a good thing there's videos, eh? Mm -hmm. All right, now let's list what's really going on with our fears because you've barely begun to scrape the surface of this particular fear with money. So we need to keep going. There's uncertainty. Right, there's uncertainty. Not worth. worth. Yes. Isolation. So, which is all about, a lot of times, let's use another word, shall we? Loneliness. Yeah. Personal discomfort, yes. 
you I still have yet to to list all of the things to do with your responsibilities. Children. Children. So what will happen to children? They might starve. They'll be taken away. Yes, big big issue. And if our children are taken away, what does that mean about me? Bad. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So I'm a bad parent now because I can't do that either. So these are quite quite a lot of addictions so far now that we're in. I might lose my uh, partner, my friendships. So yeah, what, what, what's my partner going to think? If I'm the male, lost my job, lost the thing, my partner's addicted to security and safety, what, what's she going to do? Leave me, guaranteed. And she probably will. Yeah. Yeah, so my partner will leave me. <laughs> so makes you feel comfortable? <laughs> comfortable? Yeah. Okay, you're yet to scrape the surface of even <laughs> bigger emotions. <laughs> So let's keep going. <laughs> looking good, okay. So this is to do with how other people's opinions. So uh, we'll look bad. I kind of feel like after all those things, I'm going to feel unlovable. So unloved. And unlovable. Unlovable. A failure. Sorry? You won't be able to fulfill... Yes, yeah, so I'd say it's more about comfort or uh, desires, yeah. Anything else you can think? So, totally uncontrolled, yeah. Okay, you're still not <laughs> thinking. <laughs> uh, interesting blockages here. Okay, you feel powerless. Yeah, we're still listing these kind of emotions, powerless. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of addictions, yes. This is just money. This is, <laughs> this is, this is what uh, potentially some of the things we're going to have to work through with the issue of money. Uh, and I've had to work through many of them myself, so I understand they're there. But there's even bigger ones than that. Can I get you started on the right track here? Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's ask this question. What does love feel? Because sometimes when we contrast what love feels with what fear feels, we, we'll get to see what the contrast is. So what does love feel? Does love feel trust? Yes. Okay. So what's the opposite of trust? We'll just no. I'll just write no trust. <laughs> <laughs> no trust of whom? God. God. You see... You see a lot of, our, lot of our addictions with money are all about this big addiction, self-reliance. You understand? The reason why we are so addicted to money and so addicted to, uh, you know, and have all of these emotional responses to the lack of it is because we have become addicted to relying on ourselves, right? We, we don't have any trust in God. We don't have any trust that if we engage God's laws, we engage God's principles, that everything will be looked after and provided for. Right? Now, you know the fastest way to do that? It's very simple. Is do everything for free. So you go to your work tomorrow, you say, I don't know if I want to be paid anymore. <laughs> Could I please do this job for free? Now, most of us would never consider doing that. Why? Well, firstly, probably people would think you're an idiot, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> but let's go further. We, we are so afraid of not being paid because of all these other reasons we've just listed. Yes? And so we don't do it for free. We don't give our time as a gift to other people. Now, now, what's the ideal situation on this planet? That every single person does what they desire and gives their time for free to every other person. Now, if I did that, I'd have a pretty happy life, wouldn't, wouldn't I? Yep. Now, it took me about uh, emotionally probably four years, three years, 
to work through that list of emotions that I just listed, all of those ones <laughs> <laughs> that, you, that you listed on the board, and the emotion of self-reliance. It took me about three to four years to do that. And so now myself and Mary do everything for free. And we live in a money-based environment and we do everything for free and yet very generous people such as yourselves finish up giving us the funds we need to survive. And not just survive, like we live a very comfortable life. When I say very comfortable, I don't have a flash car or, a, you know, we have a van <laughs> um, because that's what the sound equipment needs. Our, but our life is actually geared towards... Doing the things we enjoy. Passions, yeah. yeah. We live in a tent. Um, it's a pretty big tent, though. It's like, um, it's probably the area of this, uh, this flat area down the bottom here, in terms of size. It's a fancy tent. It's a fancy tent. It's got a floor. It's yeah. got a floor. <laughs> we have a lounge suite in it and mm. a king-size bed. And we have a shower outside that we, that we use and a bath inside. And we've got a... Um, a little tiny kitchen in, in it as well, and it's, it's beautiful to live in, yeah. And, and we live in that all year round generally, except when it gets really, really cold and we might have occasional days up at the office, which is a house that we have. We have an office that we have all the equipment in that we need to give the truth to the world, or, you know, to, to distribute what we're doing. And, and people have donated to us like uh, our whole office needed modification and people donated to us money to modify the whole office, right? And um, we've given away in the last year probably over 200, uh, about 150,000 DVDs, right? $200,000 worth of DVDs. And none of that, I, I didn't have any of that money. <laughs> Somebody else gave it that to me to do that. Many of you have given some of that to us to do that, right? We, we have internet sites and many of you have assisted us in providing the funds to run those sites. <coughs> we travel the world. And in the last two years, we, we've not used any... We, we don't have any funds to travel the world. So, <laughs> so other people gave them to us. Like this entire trip was paid for by one person donating some money, or two people two donating people. some money, um, so that we could go around the world and talk to different people around the world. That's pretty generous of them, isn't it? Like myself and Mary live our life constantly in gratitude. Definitely. Because it's just like an amazing life that we have, totally along how we, how passions and desires, and we don't even think about money. Like it's, it's wonderful. The only thought I have about money is how to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Like... I don't worry about how, whether it's coming in or not. If we don't have any coming in, then we don't spend any. But we trust that if we engage our passion and desire, if we do everything in harmony with the way God's designed it to be, if we do it based on a feeling or an intention of love, that we will get what we need. And we just trust that. But to trust that, it's taken like a lot of emotional work. Because all of those emotions you've just listed... And especially the emotion of self-reliance we've had to address. Yeah. So we don't rely on ourselves at all. We are completely dependent. Our entire life is completely dependent upon the generosity of others. Um, I just wanted to say that during this kind of critical time now, as we approach maybe some major earth changes, um, I'm, I'm kind of, my life is, is, is similar to yours. And it's, it's, it's taken me a lot to get to this level of trust. Yeah. Um, but do you think more people will kind of start to live this way because we kind of have an understanding that things are going to change in such a major way that um, it's important to make these changes now? Um, I don't feel, for myself and Mary, earth changes have no bearing whatsoever on the choices we make in our life. Does that make sense? Um, our choices are made totally based upon our desires. What, what do we desire to do? I feel that fear does motivate some others to change. Uh, and, and some people around us certainly have made changes only because they are, are afraid. 
but that's not what motivates myself and Mary. We're, we're motivated by our passion and desire. And I also think the assumption that after Earth changes, uh, very corrupt systems that exist on the planet will cease to exist is somehow a false assumption because it has the only way those... The only way corrupt systems can not exist on the earth is for souls to heal the error within them that supports those systems. So I feel like there's a common fallacy amongst many people that there'll be big earth changes on the planet and then we'll all go back to eating lentils and holding hands, you know, and not to make fun, you d but... <laughs> free love. <laughs> yeah, do I, I'm simplifying it just for the, for the um, purpose but, but of the example. But actually, it can be somewhat liberating if, if, if a lot of change, big changes are coming our way, it is liberating in a way to start living um, different ways. But it's not. Uh, but the but problem is that the, this assumption, as Mary just said, that the big changes mean something is, a, is an invalid assumption for a start. And the motivation to do change just because big changes are coming is not a very good motivation either. I feel it's liberating to make these changes, but only if they come from a moral place. Because, because we see that these changes are actually more in harmony with love and by living these changes, it is actually liberating. You do feel freer. Yeah. But if you and in an environment that's not libera liberated, you can still feel, feel liberated. Yes. <laughs> I agree with you. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. It is it is just exciting. Yeah. 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 And I think that if major earth changes happen on the planet soon, that has the potential to trigger a lot of emotion in people, which they then have the choice to... I, depends on which way they want to go on the flow chart. But there's absolutely no guarantee that after Earth changes that there will be no corrupt systems. Mm -hmm. We can... I agree. In, we in can fact, I would probably guarantee there will be corrupt systems. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. unless the hearts of people change, the hearts of people are corrupted. And as a result, they will create corrupt systems. I agree we can be liberated people in this system or in another system. But, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that um, we should do it in preparation for a change. We should do it because... Well, we because it's can the right do it thing to because do. Because it is the yeah. loving thing to do. Yeah. 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 And really, our, if we had a pure motive, we'd just do it because it's a loving thing to do not because other people are going to do it soon or down the track it will happen where everybody will do it or none of those reasons really will matter to us. We'll just do it because we want to do it and we have enough uh, courage to actually be amongst the first people who do it. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and eventually other people will start demonstrating that same courage, I believe. But, uh, but to make the, you know, to do it because changes are coming... What if those changes don't come? What if there are no earth changes? Would you still do it? Well, my answer is yes, we're still going to do exactly what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> earth changes, no earth changes, doesn't matter. We're still going to do what we're doing. Now, I believe quite strongly that there will be earth changes, but, but it doesn't matter to me because, because we're already doing and we'll continue to do exactly what we desire to do. But the higher vibrational energies maybe that might where things might change are causing people to to live closer to the way they want to live or at least i think so can i address this issue of higher vibrational energies sure go ahead yeah and um, that is just a long-winded way of of detuning de people from their emotions what we're talking about is the only change that will actually occur that will be beneficial on this planet is when we learn to love as humanity, we lead to love. Now, many people call that higher vibrational energy. Why do you persist in calling it higher vibrational energy? Because you're avoiding that the issue is about love. And we need to start focusing on the fact that the whole issue with the planet is not about lifting our vibrational energy, but rather it's about lifting our condition of love. We need to learn how to love. We need to learn how to react in harmony with love. When we do that, automatically everything will change. Now, while love has a higher vibration from a metaphysical perspective, the reality is that when we feel it as an emotion, that's when it will have its power. So we need to stop talking about emotions as metaphysical energy f flows, and we need to start talking about them about as what they really are. They are emotions that we can feel, 
we can, if they're negative, we can choose to release them. If they're positive, we can embrace them. And, and if we live our life fully embracing these positive emotions, the loving-based emotions, and releasing from our life the negative-based emotions, then automatically this world will be lifted into a new place if everybody does that, or even if a few people do it, every, it will happen. But I feel that often what happens is we, we're describing emotions using other, re, other words. And, and why do we do that? Because we don't want to feel the emotion. <laughs> In the end, it gets back to the same problem. We are not acknowledging it's an emotion that we need to feel. When we call it a higher vibrational energy, we are not acknowledging that it's love that we need to feel. right? And we think that we can manufacture a state of a higher vibrational energy without becoming more loving, and we can't. We need to become more loving to be in that better state. And so my, my feelings are on these subjects that we need to speak plainly to people. Whenever we use the term higher vibrational energy and other such terms, what we're doing is we're distancing ourselves from people. We're also distancing ourselves from emotion. We're distancing ourselves from the most important emotion, which is love. And what we're doing is we're creating separation. When the average person on the planet, when we speak about love, they at least understand it because most of them have at least experienced it once in their life, or many of them have. And, and so for that reason, we can now <coughs> encourage people to love more. So, so my, my encouragement of yourselves would be embrace a life where you face your fears rather than pander to them rather than supporting them. In, in, in Sweden, it was very interesting when we said this, because they were going, what do you mean panda? What do you mean panda? Because uh, uh, their language, they don't have any translation of that particular word. Well, we did find one, though. But we did finish up finding one, and it was very, very interesting translation. Right. You know what it was? It said the word panda is agreeing to and supporting someone's evil desires. It was even stronger than that. I, I've written it down in a notebook. I have to go back and find it. I'll tell you next session. But it was, whoa, very strong. Yeah. yeah. The reality is on the planet, we have a lot of evil desires. The average person on the planet, there is a lot of evil desires. Desires that are out of harmony with love and truth. If we stop pandering to them, stop supporting them, we will be confronted with the underlying fears they cover. And when we do that and feel those fears, we have an opportunity to be able to become more loving. Once we become more loving, this world will change whether earth changes occur or not. It doesn't matter. The world will change. And if enough of us embrace that and actually sincerely with our heart embrace that, then change is going to be possible en masse. But if very only then. Only, only then. then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and until that point in time... The corrupted influences of this world that begin with the corrupted emotions within the individual will continue to have an effect on the planet. They will, con they will construct corruptive uh, organisations and corrupted institutions. And that is unavoidable until we address this issue emotionally at the heart level with regard to love. But I feel we have great potential as a human race, yes? We have the ability to, to observe that this is what's happened to the world historically and to begin to be a part of change. But we're not going to be a part of change by avoiding our fears. We're going to have to confront them. Because in the end, what we would like to see on the planet is there need, needing to be no money. And still everyone lives. Like... I've often said in presentations, the most craziest thing mankind came up with is to pay for your water. Yes. One of the most craziest things to come up with. Water is an essential life requirement. Mm -hmm. To pay for it is a ludicrous proposition. Huh? Secondly, paying for your food. How crazy is that? We all need food. While, particularly while we have emotional injuries, we definitely all need food to survive. So, so 
how crazy is it that we've created an inst institutions and a whole system, a whole economic system where we have to pay for it? All of us need shelter. Every single person. So why are we having to pay for it? There's enough resources on the planet to create shelter for every individual. Uh, we shouldn't need to have pay for it. Now, I can understand having to pay for a piece of art, perhaps, or an aeroplane, or something that's out of the ordinary <laughs> in terms of because it uses more resources. But to actually pay for things that are essential for our very life makes no logical or loving sense whatsoever. And this is what we need to do. We need to start confronting these particular things. So the way we do that is we, if we personally start doing that, we'll confront all the emotions inside of us that cause us to not want to do that. All the unloving behaviour that we have will all be triggered and released very rapidly. But what I find is the majority of people do not embrace that. And while you don't embrace it, you live in the fear of it. While you live in the fear of it, you can only construct what you've already constructed. So in other words, you can only go and get a job that you get paid for. I would, I would much rather see all of you here being exactly the work you love, every single day you love it, and you do it for free, and on top of that, you're all well off because everybody appreciates the thing you do, and so they, they, they demonstrate the appreciation to you. But it's going to need your trust of that. Like so, so at the beginning, I'm going, hmm. I'm having to say I'm Jesus and everybody's going to think I'm a nut. <laughs> I have to do everything that in my life for free because that's what it feels like I have to do. And everybody's not even going to think I'm a nut now, but I'm going to be a very poor nut and not, <laughs> <laughs> and not survive very long either probably. Right? And then on top of that, I'm going to have to give away everything I've got for free and then in the end I won't have anything myself. Right? These are all emotions I had to work my way through. And I go, yeah, the likelihood of this being very successful is very low. Right? That was my opinion. At the beginning of eight years ago, that was my opinion. And, and I went, okay, but it still has to be done. Right? Even though I was afraid that that would be the outcome, it still had to be done. And somebody had to do it. Right? Somebody had to lead this process of this change. Once I started embracing that myself, I found out many things about my fear. One of the things I found was that many of the things I was afraid of never happened. Isn't that interesting? Have you found that in your life, that many of the things you're afraid of? How many, how many of you have been afraid of dying horribly in a car accident? How many of Well, obviously, you're still here, <laughs> yeah. so it hasn't <laughs> happened. <laughs> How many of you, when you get in an aeroplane, are afraid of it crashing? Yeah? You're still here, so it hasn't happened. You see, like, the majority of us fear things that ha don't actually happen. Right? And, and the reality is the majority of our fears, and I think some people have done some studies, that something like 95% of what you're afraid of never happens your entire life. And the other 5% of things that happen seem to be quite liberating once they've <laughs> happened. <laughs> or they've already and happened in the past yeah. year once before and you survived it, yeah. <laughs> which is interesting too. Yeah. So, so what we'd like to do is, uh, for the, and end off today with this, we'd like to encourage you to truly embrace your fears rather than still live in your addictions. Focus on feeling your way through your addiction so that you can find your fears and get rid of these fears out of your life, out of your soul. Get rid of them out of your soul. They will automatically disappear from your life then, right? Get, get rid of them out from inside of you by feeling them. Don't worry about what other people think about you. But if you do worry, feel that too. And feel it until it's gone. So that... In the end, every, all of these fear-based emotions will be gone. The grief, which is, remember the grief is the healing emotion. So the grief will naturally come up after that. You'll progress very rapidly once this grief starts flowing in you. And, and every single one of you have the capacity of growing rapidly as a result of just feeling through your fear and into your grief.
But while you remain in heavy addiction, one of our microphones is obviously running out of battery. While you're afraid of and living in addiction, you have no way of confronting your fear. If you have no way of confronting your fear, then of course you're never going to get to your grief. If you never get to your grief, you're never going to become at one with God. You'll never be completely happy in your entire life. There's a high likelihood you'll never be happy in your relationships. There's a high likelihood that you'll never be happy for a long time, even after you die in the spirit world, unless you do this. Remember those ladies that we talked to last night? That, that lady, um, what was her, her name, Tiffany, she had been there in the spirit world, in this state of fear, for a, an additional 60 years mm. of her life. So she'd lived a life on earth, right? And what's the average lifespan on earth? Usually it's 80 nowadays, 70 or 80 years at least. And then on top of that, she lived another 60 years thinking that she could control her fears that she didn't have to feel them and in a state of stagnation where she's not enjoying her life she there's no man no man with her in her life right her soulmates are male she's no man in her life uh, she hasn't attracted that even in the spirit world so so unless we address these particular emotions we're just going to be consigned to the same kind of life but just in a different location so it's far better if we can address them right now. Don't satisfy yourself to live in your addictions. Because in the end, you're, you're, by doing that, by making that choice, you're actually choosing a stagnant life. And, and a stagnant life is never going to be a happy one in the long run. And it's a life that's not controlled by your soul. It's a life that's controlled by denial of your soul. And so it feels, so in contrast to actually living in your soul it feels so bland really mm. it just you're just controlled by addiction that's all and not by your desire or the personality that god gave you and it's not until you sort of engage the process of confronting your addictions that you even realize how much it it it's suppressed a lot of your desires and other emotions isn't it absolutely mm. and and personality and the real yeah the yeah. real self I suppose. Yeah. yeah so that's what we'd like to encourage yeah. you to do today it's totally worth it <laughs> <laughs> well that's it today guys so we'll see you uh, i think yeah thanks